Morning all. Bright and breezy. I'm very impressed with the turnout at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit this morning about something called trauma-informed care. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the whole issue of trying to minimise restraint in practice is about trying to re-educate people a little bit. Lynn started this journey for us yesterday when she showed us uh, that very emotive footage, footage um, from Panorama. And thank God for Panorama, actually, because you know they, they often reveal uh, a number of issues that, that we're not able to do on our own. And so trauma-informed care for me is, is a significant way forward in terms of trying to re-educate and re retrain people who work with vulnerable individuals in trying to minimise and, and re uh, restrict certain interventions. And the reason I'm talking about the perfect storm as well, there's two reasons for that. On the one hand, um, I think I alluded to the fact yesterday that we are in a situation at the moment where we are in a perfect storm. You know, all the, uh, all the ducks are coming together, they're all in a row, they're all in a line, and we're sort of ready to go and move the agenda forward. So it, but it's also a, about a, cum, a culmination of factors that contribute to some of the concerns that we have, I think, about um, restrictive practices. Uh, I, I'm going to show a few video clips as well, and similar to Lynn yesterday, that, you know, they can be quite... Um, quite emotive, but I think it's really important for us to do this and to, to just keep reminding ourselves why we're here and why we're trying to do what we're doing. And, and really, why is this whole agenda important? Well, we found out yesterday why this agenda is important. You know, most of the speakers yesterday referred to um, this very, very emotive and important agenda. And, and of course, there have been high-profile cases, and some of those I will mention. There is general public concern because of the high-profile cases. Um, there's a huge political agenda at the moment about trying to minimise restrictive practices and restraint in particular. Um, growing momentum, and that's why we're here. And the reason I've sort of said shifting sands is because we, we are, that this culture shift is starting now. I, I think five years ago, we possibly still would not have been ready to start talking about um, minimising things like restraint. We wouldn't have even been considering doing anything about it necessarily. Um, but I, I, I do think that the sands are shifting substantially. And, and again, I, I often say it's not about, you know, saying that staff are not doing a good job, and, and that was mentioned again yesterday. Staff are generally doing a great job in a very hard environment, or in a hard number of environments. And I think staff want to do a good job. Staff want to make significant and important changes. So I think that's important to This private well. hospital in South Gloucestershire was meant to be a caring environment where vulnerable adults with very severe learning difficulties would get the care and attention that they needed. Uh, the reality, as exposed by that BBC Panorama investigation, was anything but. Uh, Panorama TV reporter Joe Casey went undercover. He filmed covertly. And what he secretly recorded was this shocking catastrophe of abuse and neglect and we can see uh, those images now at the end result this case 11 defendants eight men and three women all employees of Winterbourne view between them they admitted a total of 38 charges of abuse and neglect the public gallery inside court 7 today packed with the family and friends of those victims as sentencing was passed and in his sentencing remarks mr. justice Ford told the court that they had created a culture of cruelty and he said there was a... I think what I want to say about um, that particular clip is, is, is again, you know, there were some um, abusive restraint practices used um, at Winterbourne and it was about abuse, so it wasn't about poor um, practices or people using um, practices maybe not as they had been taught. This, this was abuse. So we're not actually, I'm not trying to suggest that we need to address that in terms of reducing our own practices. Clearly, we don't want that sort of practice happening generally, but that was about abusive behaviour. But I think what is important about Winterbourne is that was really one of the first things that made um, people like Norman Lamb, um, the minister, start sitting up and thinking, gosh, we need to do something about this. And, and then a whole catalogue of things started happening as a result of that. And, and he then sort of started getting key people together. He was very passionate about the whole issues. And again, I know you will have heard about that yesterday um, from Dave Atkinson as to how we got to um, positive and safe and the, and the whole agenda. Um, but it, for me, it was a very significant turning point, Winterbourne. 
Um, I, I know there's a chap called Richard um, Barnett, and he, he's a colleague of, of Chris Sterling, and, and they together have done um, some work over the years on looking at restraint practices. And I think um, one of the things for me, and, and a lot to do with trauma-informed care, again, is this notion that there are certain practices or there are certain things we need to consider that may be unsafe. Um, and, and I know prone restraint in particular has been very high on the agenda and very high in people's minds. And I would urge you not to get too caught up with the prone restraint debate, because there has been a little bit of misunderstanding, I think, in terms of the message that came out of positive and safe. Some people seem to be under the impression that it's been banned, um, and I don't want to go down that route. It hasn't actually been banned, but there are suggestions that it is a problematic um, aspect of restraint that we need to give some consideration to. And again, in, in their research, you know, they, they found that prone restraint was particularly um, problematic. And, and the thing I like about Richard's work is, again, we talk about the perfect storm. You know, even when you look at things like restraint and the things that can go wrong with restraint, it is about things coming together in an individual situation that mean that somebody could be really seriously harmed or injured or indeed die. Um, I, I think this is quite a, a telling um, quote. This is from an Australian um, academic. And, and I think that's true, really. When you think about healthcare environments um, and what we're trying to do, it, it does feel a bit strange when we start looking at issues to do with, um, with restraint. Um, and, and I think we do really need to consider these factors that can contribute to problems with restraint. I think for me, the whole issue though, as I said before, is about re-educating staff, not only about aspects of um, what they do when they're restraining people, but the, the mindset of um, how you can make significant changes to the way people think. Um, we know that there are certainly injuries associated with restraint, and again, this is why it is significantly important. There's been a lot of research done over the past uh, few years that suggests that all sorts of uh, physical injuries can result from restraint. But I think more importantly, there are other aspects that one can consider with regards to restraint, and they're psychological, or they might be to do with damaging the therapeutic relationship when we use restraint um, and restrictive practices. It's very difficult sometimes to, to, to re-engage with people in practice when you have to lay hands on, and particularly if it's been a very problematic um, exchange with staff and patients, and, and I think we do need to think about that. Uh, Colin said yesterday, Colin Dale mentioned yesterday that he and I had done some research in 2011 looking at restraint-related deaths. I, I'm only just going to tell you a little bit about that project because, again, it's important in us thinking about um, how we address trauma-informed care. We know that there have been deaths in the UK as a result of the use of restraint and some types of restrictive intervention. Um, and, and what we found when we looked back over a 10-year period for the Ministry of Justice was that there had been 38 um, restraint-related deaths in the UK in, an, oops, in a number of settings. I um, don't know why that just did that. It's got a mind of its own. Okay, so there were 38 deaths that we identified um, from various coroner's reports and from the literature. And, and some people have said to me since we did that, well, gosh, 38, that doesn't sound very many, um, you know, in a 10-year period. And, and I was quite surprised at that comment. I mean, for me, one death is one death too many, if it, particularly if it's attributed to um, something we have done. You know, that, that old-fashioned term that was called etrogenesis, whereby, you know, the healthcare system or the social care system does something to somebody and it creates a death or it, it creates harm. Uh, I thought 38 deaths seemed, was, was quite a lot. I think what some people have said, actually, they thought it would be more because they know of instances that we didn't report upon. And, and the interesting thing when we did this project was it was quite difficult to, um, to be certain and to be sure that what we were looking at was attributed to a restraint practice. And the coroner's reports don't always tag things in the right way that means that you know necessarily that that death was as a result uh, of a restraint practice. And so I suspect there have been many more near misses 
um, or even possibly deaths that have happened that we weren't able to attribute directly or certainly that the coroners haven't been able to attribute directly. But what we did find from the 38 deaths was um, almost like a, a strange sort of profile. Again, it's very difficult to make huge assumptions just from 38 cases. But these were factors that we found very common in those 38 deaths, men between the ages of 30 and 40. Um, there's a significant number of those deaths who were male and between that age range. These are things we can think about and learn from. People with mental health problems were clearly, um, many of them were individuals with mental health problems who had died. And, and significantly, the issue of the prone restraint um, reared its head. I think it was, well, I know it was 26 of the 38 cases um, had been held in the prone restraint position. So that there's something to be gleaned from that. Um, and, and a lot of issues related to prone restraint revolved around things like the number of staff involved, the length of time, the position, as I've just mentioned, and whether there was any um, struggle on physical stresses at that time. And again, these are things we need to learn from. Um, and and just, this is, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the averages that we found of those 38 deaths, um, you know, we, we found anywhere between 2 to 15 staff had been involved in the restraint incidents. The length of time, you can see there, range from 10 minutes to one hour, 40 minutes, and time held in prone before collapse, two to 12 minutes, and the average time, 5.6 minutes. So, you know, uh, quite a variable issue there. Only on 7 News, a mother fighting for justice in her son's death. Wants you to see the video the state wanted to keep under wraps. But Call 7 investigator John Ferrugia has seen the surveillance video and it shows a man strapped face down as he struggles to breathe. We have to warn you, the images are disturbing. This is an isolated room in the high security forensic unit at the state mental hospital in Pueblo. When he walked through the door, he knew what they were going to do. In August of last year, as a surveillance camera recorded, a patient, 41-year-old Troy Geske, was thrown face down on a fixed padded platform where for several minutes he was physically and forcefully restrained while leather straps were tied around his arms, legs, and waist. This is called prone restraint. When I watched my son being put face down, leaned on by four huge men, not allowing any part of his body to move his head or anything. All I thought of was inhumane. Linda Stevens is Troy Geske's mother. She watched the recording in horror as she saw her son struggle to breathe while those restraining him seemed oblivious. One pressing his face to the table. One had his elbow in his back. It's not good at all to be compressed like that. We showed this video to Dr. Harlan Lubin, an MD and psychiatrist who works for Denver Health and covers the Denver Detention Center and County Jail. Just by virtue of the position, you, you, it's, you, know, you really can't get a good breath consistently. Dr. Lubin has worked with disturbed and violent patients, including adolescents in youth corrections, and he believes face-down restraint is unnecessary. I don't think that there's any reason why prone restraint should be used as opposed to other types of restraint. You're just bringing on a lot of added uh, risks when you do prone restraint. As the camera recorded, the Pueblo staff left Troy Geske in the room alone, checking periodically from the window as he struggled to raise his body and breathe. There is no sound on the recording. I imagine my son going, <gasps> <gasps> suffocating slowly. Their brain has to know I'm going to die, I can't breathe. Quite traumatic, I think, to watch that. And clearly, again, mostly we don't use mechanical restraints and, and straps of that sort. I mean, the key message there is it was still prone restraint. Uh, and we, um, I mean, clearly when our staff would, would leave somebody, um, they, they would be able to move around. But, I mean, it's, we, we don't have the, the luxury in some regards of being able to see through CCTV what happens when things go wrong. Whereas in America and Australia, commonly, they, you know, they have CCT everywhere and so that you can sort of scrutinise and look at these issues. But I, I do think, and again, this is about the trauma-informed aspect, you know, we, we as staff need to be constantly reminded of when things can go wrong and, and get into the head, I think, of families and patients of what that must look like and feel like when somebody's in that sort of um, vulnerable position not necessarily with mechanical restraints, but just in restraint generally. And I said about trauma, it's not just about um, physical concerns. It's, it's about all of these other things. We know from the research 
um, which is, is growing now, I think, in this area. It's still very slim and very limited, but it is growing, that we know that these are the sorts of things that people report. Um, you, know, you know, for patients to feel that this is a type of punishment and that it's humiliating uh, and those sorts of things really needs to feed into our thinking when we are trying to make changes as to how we can minimise that in the future. And there has been a plethora of research from a, a few people in the, in the room today. Um, and, and again, with regards to what's been happening in the past, what, what is reported quite regularly is, and, and even since, actually, the, the early 1990s, Richard Whittington talked about staff going in strong. You know, that's quite a substantial amount of time ago in, in early 1990s. And to, and to think we were beginning to recognise then that we needed to start rethinking um, what we were doing and how we were doing it. And I, I think even now, we still don't really know the nature of restraint uh, and what happens with regards to restraint. So it's not about blame. <laughs> Took a bit of time, guys. I know it's early. Um, you know, it really isn't, and I, I, I do want to get that message across. I mean, clearly, in, in cases like Winterbourne, then yes, it is about blame, and it has to be about blame. But I, I think generally it's, it's about us all sort of going on this journey together to try and minimise restraint and restrictive practices, to get on board with this idea of, of the perfect storm and, and to move forward and to support and help each other in making changes. We, we need to do this together. It, it can't be done in isolation. I just wanted to mention as well, be, before I show you uh, some other clips to... to give this idea of how we need to keep thinking about trauma-informed care. I, I think the other thing that's a really important issue in all of this is, is last resort. I, I have I've been sort of banging on about last resort probably for a good few years now, because my sense is that, generally speaking, um, last resort isn't always last resort. Um, and I, I think, and I, I, I was a ward sister, I, I've worked in practices myself, um, I've worked in um, psychiatric intensive care units, I've used restraint, and I've probably um, used restraint inappropriately at times, or, or for reasons that really, I, when I look back now, possibly wouldn't have been classed as, as last resort. And, and a, piece of, a piece of work I did very early on in my research career was um, looking at staff and patients' views and attitudes about practices. And interestingly, as part of that project, I asked staff to record when they were using restraint and, and why they were using it. And that, there was about 25% of the cases that I looked at that were not attributed to um, imminent dan danger and imminent harm. So 25% of those incidents, people had been restrained because they told the staff to, um, pardon my language, F off or something along those lines. That doesn't feel necessarily like last resort to me. And again, I think we need to think about these issues. We know so little about last resort. It's mentioned all the time. It's in all the, the guidelines. It's in, it's in the NICE guidelines. It's in the new guidelines. It's in the DH guidelines. Um, but do we really ever explain to people quite what that means or, or how it should be thought about or how it should be delivered. And again, I think that's something we've got to grapple with, is how do you make those judgments about when to use restraint? Um, and, and what is the general agreement between teams? Because I, I'm sure all of you, uh, similar to me, have maybe worked with people who always seem to be on the end of a difficult situation or always seem to be on the end um, of a restraint incident or an aggressive incident. And it may be that there are some people that are really good at just using restraint as last resort. It may be that there are others not, but we certainly need to look at this issue much more.
these are just a, a small selection of, of cases that, uh, that we reported upon, but also that have, have happened in other parts of the world. I said to you yesterday, this isn't just an issue in the, in the UK. Um, I, I was actually sent a, a clip of a, an incident in Belgium recently that involved nurses and, and the police in a, in a mental health unit. And um, to be honest, it's a bit too shocking to watch. I, I didn't really feel quite ready to show it today. Um, and, and it really is frightening. And I think we, we need to be reminded of these instances and these situations in order to really reconnect our hearts and our heads when we're thinking about um, making changes and, and how we can make significant changes. And, and that's my point, I think. The reason I'd put this up, up here was literally because I mentioned yesterday we're, we're about to do a project in the northwest of England where we're looking at minimising and reducing the use of, strength, of restraint um, using something called the Six Core Strategies. And we call the project Restrain Yourself. And the, and the S is small because it's about retrain yourself. And, and that is important because, for me, a lot of this minimising restrictive practice is about re-educating staff in a slightly different way um, than we have done historically in the past. And I'm delighted that we have, you know, we have some fabulous trusts that we're working with who, who are on board with this um, venture, and, and that's great. And I just wanted to say a personal thank you because I know some of them are here in the audience today. Um, and, and so, really, as I'm... I'm Coming up to, to close, and I have about five minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it really is, I suppose, knowing that we are in this situation of a perfect storm, knowing that, that the time is right for us to, to start doing things and making changes. Um, the, you know, what do we need to do and, and how do we need to do it? Well, well, clearly, education is a huge part of that. And as I say, reintroducing people's hearts and minds to, to, um, to move the agenda forward. But we also need to do all of these things. And, and I know Iris yesterday talked about, was it co-production rocks was mentioned yesterday. And, and again, it, it, it's, it's hugely important that on this journey, you know, we work with, um, I mean, co-production is with, you know, staff as well. So staff, patients, families, to understand the, the challenges, the barriers, the difficulties we have in our own environments in order to be able to start addressing those um, and making changes and making stage changes with people and taking them on this journey. Uh, and it is about training staff and empowering them. It, it isn't about, as I said, it's not about blaming the cat. Um, you know, it is about helping them move forward. And, and importantly, the sharing and networking, which clearly is what this is all about. I mean, I, I think this has been a great two days. And, and the, resta the, the Restraint Reduction Network is is has the potential to be a very, very powerful tool for everybody, I think, once it, once it rolls out and people get on board with it. Where people who are managing to overcome the barriers and the hurdles and, and finding ways forward can report through the network. And, you know, we can all learn from each other and share. And, you know, talk about the difficulties that we're encountering, why we're encountering them, and how we make positive changes um, about them. So I think there are really important things that we need to do. Um, and I also think that we need to do this through, um, firstly, being up for the challenge. Uh, and I suspect a lot of you are ready for the challenge of making this huge leap of faith and changing the culture. But it's about knowing the right tools and the right opportunities to use. And I know Len's going to be talking about safe wards this morning, and that's one um, you know, significant model and tool that I think people can use to try and make some changes. Um, you know, we heard from NHS Protect yesterday ab about the, you know, the opportunities and tools that they, um, you know, have out there that people can assist them in making, uh, making significant changes. But it's about everybody working together, for sure. Um, I, I think, really, my final thoughts are... There is growing evidence that um, coercive practices are problematic. We, we know increasingly that they are counterproductive, that they're counter-therapeutic. You know, we know that. Staff know that. You know, I know in a lot of interviews I've done over the years, staff feel very dissatisfied with the, with the, the state of play in their settings and, and want to make positive changes. Um, and, and it is odd, isn't it, in a sense that, you know, given that we are now in 2014, 
that, that we are still uh, at a point where we're, we're feeling that we're, we're not connecting necessarily at times with individuals. Again, when Lynn talked about compassionate care, you know, that, that notion of, you know, that surely that's what we're in the game for. And it's so easy, I think, to get out of the habit of connecting with that compassion and, and feeling that compassion with the people that we work with. Um, and I, I thought this was a very telling um, view, really, from, from Cutliffe and Santos, and I, I think it's an important issue. And I, I spoke to, to Len recently. We, we're both sitting on the NICE guidelines at the moment, um, that, which are being renewed and looked at and are due to be published uh, next year. But again, interestingly, the evidence base is still pretty slim in terms of trying to produce gold standard guidelines. And, and it still you know, will boil down to people's thoughts and views and opinions. But for me, the great thing is, is at events like this, opinion is shifting um, into one sort of um, movement forward. And I, I think that's the, the great thing about that. So that was all I wanted to say, guys. Um, it is the perfect storm. Please take the opportunity and, and please pledge your, uh, your view on the, on the new Restraint Reduction Network. Thank you.